Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for today's event, and I welcome you. As always, we have a great webinar on tap today, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of it, you will be able to watch it again. After today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar on demand. And we are taking questions from the audience. So if at any time during today's presentation, you have a question for either of our panelists, please don't wait, don't hesitate. Just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your question. And we'll take as many questions as we can near the end of today's presentation. All right, with that, we will go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is CI plus CD plus release orchestration. See why it's better under one roof. Our speakers today are Sean Ahmed, who is Vice President of Product Marketing at CloudBees, and he's being joined by Anders Valgren, who is VP of Technology at CloudBees. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. So Thank Sean, you, Sean. I know, yeah, yeah, you're welcome. I know that you are going to be kicking us off, Sean. So I'm going to put myself on mute and let you get to it. All right. Well, thank you. Um, it's really great to be with you. Thank you, Charlene. And I'm I'm really excited to be joined by Anders, my uh, partner in crime here at Cloud Beast. So very excited about uh, telling you about some uh, some of the uh, topics that we're going to be covering here, and uh, a little bit around where we're headed, and uh, a little bit about what you can do with Cloud Beast today. Um, by way of background, my name is Sean. I've been with CloudBase roughly about six months prior to this uh, background in multiple large and small companies and uh, predominantly been focused on the development side of, of, of things um, and uh, partly also been in charge of uh, development studios and um, had a great lot of fun uh, building some great technology and bringing to market and super excited about joining CloudBase. Uh, Anders, why don't I pass it over to you? A little bit about yourself. Sure, Sean. Uh, so my name is Anders Walgren. I've been uh, VP of uh, Technology Strategy at CloudBees for oh about two months now. Um, before that, uh, I was a, a CTO at Electric Cloud for uh, about 15 years, and then of course uh, Electric Cloud was acquired by uh, CloudBees uh, just recently. So I've uh, transitioned uh, in, into that role, uh, but uh, happy to be here. Yeah. Well, thanks for joining me today, Anders. Well, look, um, we'll begin by talking a little bit about uh, how we've joined forces. Um, we're really, really excited as, as a company, CloudBeast, that we have had the opportunity to join forces with Electric Cloud. Um, CloudBeast's focus has, has for a long time been in the CI CD space and de facto uh, leader in the CI space with offerings and uh, in the arena of Jenkins, Jenkins X. Uh, both in terms of being the largest single corporate sponsor there, but also 85% uh, of code commits that are done to those environments have been done by, by us. And uh, so in many ways, moving down the SDLC to help people bring software to market faster, um, release orchestration was one of those areas that um, we really found uh, was the new frontier for many of our customers as they got really good at CI. And to be able to join forces with uh, Electric Cloud, the de facto market leader in that uh, arena, that was simply a, a, a really great moment for all of us at CloudBees. However, a lot of companies will ask us the question and say, well, you joined forces, that is great. We understand that you've covered more of, of the SDLC, but, but what is the impetus? What is the bigger picture around this? Why did you do it? And a lot of that has to do with where our customers are at in their digital transformation. Uh, there used to be a time when, when you know, we used to say software is eating the world, but uh, I'd venture to say that, you know, and, and I think Andres would agree with me here that software is already eating the world. And there's some learnings to take away from those digital transformations that uh, companies have embarked on as they have implemented DevOps, as they have gotten better at CI and CD and ARO. They tell us that the most important thing to them in these digital transformations as it pertains to the software is safely and quickly get new innovation to market in hands of customers quickly to create sustainable uh, competitive differentiation. They'll also tell us that we have to treat and make software development and delivery a core part of the business. It, it has to be as natural part of our DNA 
as what we've been doing for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, whichever industry they've been in. And we need these things to get more intelligent. We need to be able to introduce more AI and we need to be able to introduce more uh, machine learning into our processes. Well, um, for many of our customers on the CloudBeast side, that was Jenkins. That journey has started with Jenkins. Uh, it is the de facto platform for CICD for many of our customers and 20 million users uh, that we know of are using this on a day-to-day -day basis with their workloads. Um, there's 200,000 implementations that call home uh, and there's even uh, orders of magnitude greater than don't. So in fact, when companies get started, Jenkins is usually a top of mind. Similarly, uh, I wondered, Anders, you guys have done phenomenally well in the CDRA space. Um, why don't you tell me a little bit or the audience a little bit about how your journey has been and how you guys ended up becoming the leaders there? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's really been a great, uh, you know, great journey, great process. Um, you know, obviously working very closely with, with our customers uh, to, to, to make this happen. But, you know, what, what we focused on the last, the last few years is, has really been, you know, what we call adaptive release orchestration. That's one word for it. it see, continuous delivery release automation is, is one of the terms that uh, Forrester uses for it. And, and we've been, you know, and as you can see in this chart, as I like to say, bragging a little bit, I have to admit, we're literally off the chart on this one. Um, and, and, and really what that comes down to is our ability to, to manage pipelines and environments and orchestrate releases and automate deployments. And, and really we're, we're, we're the only solution out there that lets you both start fast and adapt to whatever your unique needs are as they evolve over time. So a lot of our customers are, you know, they're not necessarily starting out being, you know, massive DevOps adopters, right? They want to get there. That is, that is the desired state. And, and one of the things that we, we do with our customers is help them along that journey by meeting them where they are today. So if you, whatever your process is today, that is something that we can bring at the flow and, and model in flow and, and be able to, uh, to bring that along and then adapt to your needs as, as, uh, as, as they change and as they evolve. And it's, it's been a great journey, really, really been enjoying it. Well, thanks, Anders. And, and I guess, Anders, you'd agree with me that, um, you know, those customers of ours that have sort of implemented CICDRO they, they tend to, on the Dora metrics, do phenomenally well. Um, not everybody may have gone completely over to the stage where they've become elite performers, but I would think that most companies that have uh, practiced CI, CD, and DevOps, both culturally, tooling-wise, automation, orchestration, they will all say, look, we deploy code more frequently uh, into production than we used to do before by orders of magnitude. Um, and we we fail less. Um, we we certainly fail less uh, in bringing these features to market. And when and if we have a failure, we recover a ton faster. And and so uh, a lot of customers will will say that to us, and 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 we will see them grow orders of magnitude as they try to achieve getting into that elite area. So it's a great job to most practitioners that are out there. Who have, or all practitioners that have grown uh, and done um, large, large jumps in their Dora metrics. However, when we are out there, and and again to just remind everybody, we're talking about you know what the impetus for us joining Focus was, and how that benefits all of you guys. It was a challenge at the heart of that that we were still seeing, even though customers are adopting CI, they're adopting CD, and doing ARO. We would find that our customers, when we talk to them, at least on the Cloud B side, we would speak to developers and engineering management folks, would say, you know, what prevents you from really getting to the elite? We would hear things like developers saying, hey, look, um, yeah, we've gotten really great at developing the code, but I'm unclear how people are using it. I don't know how to improve it. I don't really know what that experience at the end is. I am just so focused on writing code and getting code out, and I don't even have access to who uses it, simple things like, who are the users? What are their titles? Where do they work? Where in the world are they? When it, during the day do they use it? How do they use it? And are they getting an impact out of it? Just completely divorced from that process. And we're not seeing um, you know, a lot of our work getting to production fast enough. We're not getting to experiment with it. We're just not getting our, 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 our code into production, be able to uh, test it and drive it in production the way some of the elite companies are doing. And, and 
what we're ending up doing is spending a ton of time not developing, just chasing bugs, chasing issues, pointing fingers, and we don't like it. What we like to do is solve really great problems in really innovative ways and deliver features fast. That's what we want to do. So when we went and talked to the management of those teams and said, well, what's going on with you guys? We'd hear all the time, well, you know what? We're really frustrated with things like imposed deadlines that are coming from the business. We're not directly connected with why the business wants this feature or that feature. We're not really seeing the user story. Some of us know it, but the speed at which we need to get information out because there's an imposed deadline frequently makes us regress back to making very hard, really just, just choices about how to deliver the software and something's going to have to get cut. And with the addition of having lack of visibility to the people, the tool chains and DevOps and data role technology that we're using, we're, we're only going about as fast as we can. And so we're not going to get any better. And, and I know, Anders, you guys worked a lot with ops folks. What did you guys hear? Uh, a lot. I mean, you know, and, and we work both with ops and also with, with release managers, right? I, I, I think, you know, I don't know where I would slot them in on, on, on the chart here, but, but they play a, a pretty important uh, role, especially in organizations that are not, not maybe quite all the way to, to sort of complete continuous uh, delivery or, or complete sort of DevOps end to end. Uh, there, there still is, is quite a bit of uh, release management going on. And, and, and I think, you know, th there are very similar complaints there, right? Um, you know, speaking a little bit on the, on the release side in terms of just lack of visibility. When are things going to show up? Um, what are the approvals? You know, if, if, if you're working in a governed industry and, and or using ITSM or ITIL type processes, you know, how do I get things into production? What are the, the gates that I have to jump through? What are the approvals that I need to get? And, and what are the, you know, what are the, you know, the, the, the tools that I have to use to do that? And, you know, we're, we're, we're pretty used to seeing this phenomenon in the industry where, Agile has been incredibly successful and powerful, but it's it's mostly, I would argue, helped the development side of the house in becoming faster. And 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 then you have you know this issue where basically um, you know you you might have a, a CI cycle where you you run all of your tests and get all of your code done in 10 minutes, and then it takes 90 days to get that code into production, right? Because of the process that's involved right. in that. So, Right. So orchestration and enablement and, and, and all of those things are incredibly important to gain velocity there while at the si same time having that safety, right? So it's speed and safety is, 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 is really what's important there to, uh, to these folks. I, I couldn't agree more. So, so, so Anders, I, I mean, what we see with our customers is, is, uh, is that we, we fundamentally, what we have today and the root cause for some of these challenges above and beyond is, is really that teams and people within teams, the tool chains they use, the processes across them are very often just very disconnected, they're fragmented, um, and often because of it, there's no real common language being used to communicate between the various teams and people. We feel that data often ends up being siloed in its own systems and you don't get that cross visibility that you want and, and processes end up being dictated inside of the individual tools that they're using in their DevOps tool chains. Um, and, but sometimes, you know, if you're using CI, CD, you're, you're, you're at least orchestrating some of that. Um, but all across, you just don't have it. And where you really want to be, organization tell us is, we want to be seamless. We all want to feel like we're a connected organism firing like a, you know, a, a, a synaptic network where everybody's firing at the right time and we're reducing the traffic related to just sort of hit and miss traffic along the way. That's what we really wanted to do. And so in context of why did, again, um, CloudBees and, 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 uh, and Electric Cloud join forces, you think about what we were thinking about jointly was the introduction of how to solve this particular set of problems. And for both of our companies, what we found was and what CloudBees was uniquely inventing and thinking about was this, this area of capabilities that we are introducing as a category of new capabilities in the market, software delivery management. At the heart of that, we were thinking about what does it mean if you had a common data set across your entire DevOps tool chain? Could you capture all of that data that is being generated, the artifacts, that are being generated by different teams, different people, different tools, often tool chains sitting at 60, 90, 80 tools being used. 
um, if you were to common catch them in one place and provide a single place where you could look at the relationship with these assets, what would that look like? And not having to replace the existing DevOps tool chains. People are going to use what they love to use. But if we were able to extract that information, bringing it into to, to, to one place, what kind of guiding principles around universal insight would that mean? What kind of insight could you get? Would you be able to do continuous learning better? Would you be able to cross the data pool that you have in your process left to right in the SDLC, go up and down and depth and, and stay at the high level? Would you be able to get those types of views across your software development and delivery chain that you typically don't have? Um, oh, wait a second, what would that mean to processes? If processes and governance and workflows could be defined across these tool chains, inherently such that multiple number of teams were operating almost like a business process of software delivery, similar way that the business has done with theirs, would we be able to get speed and, and be on the same page without having to have one meeting after another meeting? I, we think that would mean that all functions would be collaborating more purposely, purposeful and seamlessly to amplify the value creation that everybody is involved in at different times doing different things in the SDLC. Those were guiding principles for us when we introduced the software delivery management category of capabilities in software. And so when we think about how do you enter that market, we're introducing in the very near future CloudBees version three, where our engines and execution engines and the various capabilities from both companies come together into a single powerful suite amplified by SDM capabilities. These SDM capabilities have four core or five core tenants to it at the heart of which sits a system, a common system of record that ingests information from your SDLC or DevOps tool chains all the way from research all the way through to how it's being adapted and used and supported by, uh, by, by the company in, the, in, in production. And throughout that entire process, it's driving and defining those relationships that provide you the opportunity to both actively ad hoc query the actual data itself, generate dashboard and reports, so you can have individual Dora metrics on applications, on teams, you could take a look at the task individual developers could have their dashboard. You could have the kind of views that their management can get at the highest level from a support engineer that could track their way all the way back to a user story or somebody in the development chair sitting and creating a new feature that can triage across users, research, market data that has been done and meetings that have been had, data that has been generated on what the problem statement should be what is the issue that we're trying to solve? That type of access with policies that you can put in place as you start deploying policies across the SDLC that include multiple teams across different multiples, multiple different types of tool chains with workflows that you can kick off with processes that you can define and intelligence like recommendation engines that could learn the baselines of how and where you develop so that you can take the, the AI that you want to bring to our system of record and really run some sophisticated analysis on the data that allows you to forecast better, that allows you to look at the world in terms of predicting better on how and where you deliver your software. Another view of that is kind of think about on the left side, all these input points, just a slightly different view. But I've only showing here roughly, you know, nine, 10 different tools. I'm sure some of you guys use these tools in itself on a day-to-day -day basis, and they all generate a ton of assets and artifacts that get collected throughout the entire process. Imagine a world in which all of these are connected so that you can easily start asking questions, no matter who you are within the organization that is involved in the value creation effort of software. You could be a developer, you could be on the ops side, you could be on a PM, you could be a PMM, you could be on the um, you know, support side, it doesn't really matter. You all have the same view into the data of where a request is, what features are deployed where, what strategies and hypotheses did we make. All of these things are now connected in one place so that you can start uh, making some, some really intelligent decisions about the process. 
And when that happens, we believe that we have a very unique place and opportunity together as one cloud bees. I think our opportunity is very similar to what the opportunity was presented to many companies that your organizations may know today. Take SAP. They really, really, really standardized the process around order to cash. Salesforce did the same from a customer opportunity candidate all the way through to business. Workday does the same for a potential candidate to a successful employee. We can do the same for our software idea all the way through to adoption. And that's the glue that we want to become, the cornerstone of company's core we want to become and think we have the opportunity to be. But that's our future. That's why the impetus for us coming together is, but there's a journey you can start today. And that's what Andres and I are really, really excited about is most companies may not have a full knowledge of what CloudBees is all about. So this is a journey that you don't have to wait for. SDM-like software is not something that uh, you have to wait for. There's core capabilities that you can start with today. Um, and at the heart of, Cl of, of, of CloudBeast's suite today is Jenkins. We've always been known as, as the contributors and code committers to Jenkins and supporting Jenkins open source environments, the community, as well as the contributions we make to the code. But we've also over the years created support and services around SIAS CD and generally DevOps and support around OSS environments for Jenkins and our own distributions. This has been the key cornerstones of the business that we had. But with time, we've also created commercial offerings that uh, improve upon of the OSS environments with new capabilities, some proprietary, and we're constantly pushing proprietary capabilities also into our free distributions of the OSS software as well. Uh, Core is a great commercial solution that people get into when they're doing multi-team management of CIs, when you have multiple teams, multiple masters, multiple processes running, multiple teams running CI to get a more controlled, centrally managed system for all of your efforts that can run natively in both modern or, 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 or on traditional platforms to, to get your, your loads up and running in such a way that you can um, scale your system, manage it from one place and have all the computing power at your fingertips. Core is a great place to start going to do that. But then customers also move from CI/CD into ARO. And we are now extremely excited about having Flow or CloudBeast Flow as our adaptive release orchestration engine as part of that process. This is an incredibly powerful engine that we're gonna start showing you today on the call. It gives you the opportunity to actually bring software to market faster, brings, takes control on and provides governance over very complex release orchestration processes where you have complex hybrid environment, whether you're delivering applications to Kubernetes cluster or cloud native apps versus applications on, on bare metal or, or your own environments, self-managed. Um, it has the ability to orchestrate those processes in a beautiful way to ensure that those people who need to be involved are involved, the decision gates, approvals, and the process runs smoothly from end to end, that automation is being done on testing and checking and auditing and policies that you're putting in place. That's really, really important part of actually getting the software safely to the actual production environment. And for some of our customers who then like to just have a very opinionated, let me just get going with DevOps, small team. I just want to get started now, get out of my way. We can get you started with CI CD with CodeShip in just a simple few minutes uh, with a very opinionated way of doing that. And across all of that, we provide insight and analytics to the system with DevOptics. So these are some of our commercial offerings that you can bolt upon. Uh, some of the open source uh, offerings that you may be in today. But if you take the products aside and you just really think about how do people actually use this? What are they actually doing with the software and, and how does that work? Uh, really what the way in which you, our customers really get into it is they start with CI. They start with build and test automation. That's where our customers begin. And many customers who are running applications or building applications that take long times to build, that examples of those are, are C, C++ application, IoT application, large mobile builds, things that where you're looking at, you know, multiple hours of build and test time. We also have build acceleration as a capability that came from Electric Cloud. This allows you to take hour long builds and deploy those builds in such a way 
and test them such a way that it can be reduced down to just mere minutes to do it. Very often, feature management is being used directly from the get-go in the coding so that we can bring our feature releases and decouple some of the features from the actual deployments such that you can deliver and bring features directly into production environments and observe and manage them, experiment, do A-B testing, and have that safety switch called the kill switch, or that, that sort of insurance policy that if things aren't working, you can turn them off. That's a powerful way developers want to use to get features out of market faster and get the feedback they require and then bring the feedback back to improve continuously the feature, and when ready, get it quickly delivered, deployed, and released to your ARO flow. We believe that that's something you can do today to bring innovation to market safely and at accelerated speeds. And that's something that we're really excited about showing to you today. So I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Anders here to take us through the scenario that we're gonna be looking at here. Anders, over to you. All right. Thanks, Sean. <clears throat> so I just want to tell you a little bit about what I'm going to show you before I, I show it to you. Um, basically, we're going to look at uh, what we call our Acme Global Motorcycle Storefront application, which is just a sample app that we're, uh, we're using. So we'll take a look at kind of what that looks like inside of uh, Flow and then take a look at an example of a Fro Flow release pipeline uh, that's, uh, that's uh, been uh, set up around that and the stages and tasks and, you know, integrations with tools. Uh, in uh, in uh, in uh, in that case, and then you know look at things like our approval uh, gates uh, in uh, in the various uh, uh, in between the various stages, which can be automatic or manual. Uh, obviously, we prefer that they be automatic. I think everybody would, but you know we we uh, we acknowledge the reality of the fact that we still do some manual processes and and do allow for that. Um, and then look a little bit and talk a little bit about the audit auditability and change history and how that plays into the kind of the governance and auditability aspects of, of the software development lifecycle for, uh, for organizations that are subject uh, to those kinds of requirements. Look a little bit about the, uh, at the environment modeling and, and promotion model that we have. And then just go through a, a simple, very quick kind of example of a code commit you know, path to production. And, and focusing in particular on the integration between you know, the great Jenkins CI uh, uh, process and then how that kicks off uh, using the integration into a flow release pipeline, and then go through that flow release pipeline and, and, and show a little bit of things like ITSM integration uh, and, uh, and, and those kinds of things. And whoops, I went a little bit too far there. So let me back up one slide here if I can. There we go. Sorry about that. So, so here we see the, um, whoa, okay. I may not be the only one controlling the slides here. <laughs> sorry about no, that. It seems like, uh, sorry, Anders, it seems like my mouse pointer was going crazy here. So I have not touching the mouse pointer on my keyboard. I apologize. Right, good. <laughs> Step away from the mouse, sir. Um, stepping away. <laughs> So here, uh, so here is just a, a, a quick overview of, of what an application model uh, looks like in uh, Electric Flow. Uh, in this case, we've, we've got a couple of uh, uh, pieces here. We've got a back end which has a couple of components in there: a database component and a, a back end, you know, server component essentially, and then a Node.js based front end. And this is just a simple example uh, to show, you know, how you can model applications. Uh, inside of, uh, of Electric Flow. And part of the reason for doing that modeling is, is to be able to then construct processes around that model and, for example, put together what we see here, which is, which is a release pipeline in, in Flow. So a, a few things that I want to point out here and, and, and talk about. Uh, the, the first thing is that our release pipelines, our pipelines in general, are structured around what we call stages. So the columns that we see here, pre-QA, QA, pre-prod, QA, pre prod, even audit reports are, are stages. Now the audit report one, and I'll talk about that in a minute, is a little bit more of a logical stage as opposed to the other ones, which are, you know, execution stages. Um, so, so for example, uh, taking a look at the at the pre-QA stage, you can then see what we have inside that column. There are tasks, and really this is where we start to see all of the integrations that we have in Electric Flow to all of the tools that you already use. You know, one one of one of our kind of uh, a philosophical mantra is that you know we, we don't want to come in with flow and be you know the the hundred and first tool that you use to deliver your software because you've already got a hundred tools. Our, our our point of view and what we're trying to do is really to be the tool that helps you run or be the platform that helps you run all the other tools, right? 
and 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 so to that end what we what we have is a multitude of integrations with all of the you know the tools that you that you know and love and and, and use you know issue tracking tools source code management tools security scanning tools ci tools you know uh itsm tools you know all of all of those kinds of things chat ops slack twitter uh, everything uh, you know everything and then one of the one of the things that we also have is you can create uh, uh, gates uh, between these stages so you can have exit gates or entry gates and this is where uh, we would have things like for example at the you know at the verify qa notify uh, task here in the pre-prod stage you, you can see that we have a little bit of a manual the little hand there basically we have a manual verification that has to happen there and that could be because maybe you're doing manual testing at that point maybe it's not fully automated Obviously, philosophically, we would love for everything to be automated, but you know, reality is reality, and not all of us have, have been able to automate all of our tasks, and we allow for that. And then, and and I'll point out another thing here too, which we'll see in the uh, in in the example as we go forward a little bit here, is we we have an ITSM integration here with with ServiceNow, so we can create a a change request uh, before we go into prod, which obviously would be important for for any uh, any organizations that uh, that are that are governed. Uh, in 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 that sense, and as we go forward here, uh, another thing I want to point out is kind of the on the right side here in the in the audit report stage, which again is more of a logical stage than sort of a physical uh, execution stage. But what we do there is we collect uh, we can collect lots of different audit information that may be important to you, you know, approval reports. So you know, kind of a, a list of who approved what in the pipeline, evidence reports. So if you are obliged to collect evidence of certain things. For example, um, you, you, you have uh, policies around code coverage. You might have policies around uh, tests that you need to run. You may need to provide evidence that you did all the security scans that you were supposed to do, those kinds of things. And maybe you're collecting things like duration reports because you're tracking cycle times. So you want to make sure that you know, hey, we do have a manual stage in here. We do request manual approvals. We want to make sure that we don't spend, you know, days and days and days waiting for those approvals we want to spend you know minutes or at most hours on that so you may be collecting information about that so that's good for audit that's good for governance another thing that we have as well here which you can see here if i were to click on the uh on the on the little button here we also have a, a notion of change history which is really more about kind of what changed and what's happened here and you can look and see a very detailed view of all the operations that have been done to the model, to the processes, to all the objects that we can we can see here. Now, this is less about auditing and governance and more about, you know, hey, this worked yesterday and it's broken today. What changed? Right. So everything that you do in in in, uh, in the flow product is, is, is changed, has change history. So you can go back and see what changed and you can see, oh, you know, somebody made a change yesterday and that caused the problem. And you can even roll back those changes. And there's lots of functionality around around managing. Uh, those types of things, you know, very, very important to, to keep things running, obviously. So the next thing I want to talk about here is a little bit about environment and, and configuration uh, type management. And what we see here is kind of the, the, the view of the various environments that are being used in our stages here. So we've got our, our Acme motorcycle application and our, our four stages that we have here, the pre-QA, QA, pre-prod, and prod. And each one of them is associated with an environment. The little orange icons here are, are represent environments. Um, Flow has a rich set of functionality around environment management, whether that be talking to existing environments and just you know, doing deployments on them or running work on them, or even configuring the entire life cycle of, of environments, setting up Kubernetes clusters, setting up containers, setting up virtual machines, talking to AWS, talking to Google Cloud, talking to, to Azure, you know, all of those kinds of integrations are there. So you may be deploying, you know, you may be deploying into a fixed environment when you go into production, it's all set up, or maybe it's a blue green environment that you're, you're doing a, a, a more sophisticated deployment to. But quite often, you know, for, for pre-QA and sort of the earlier stage environments, it's nice there to be able to have environments that get set up and torn down all the time so that you don't have resource consumption when they're not being used and you know that they're always set up correctly and you don't kind of have these, you know, snowflake environments. Uh, that, that you might suffer from. So each, you know, each uh, stage here we've associated with a particular environment and, and we'll typically do a deployment uh, into that environment as part of the tasks that are being done in that particular stage. And part of this, you know, harkens back in, in, in a lot of ways to some philosophy.
use them for your earlier environments. Now, you know, when you when you deploy into production, you might be hitting a lot more machines. You know, you may have a cluster of machines that you're running on, whereas if you're running in your QA environment or your pre-QA environment, you may have one or just a couple or so. But the essential part of the deployment process is the same. And, and our point of view very strongly is treat that deployment process as a feature of your product, as a feature of your pipeline, so that when you get to the part where you're deploying into pre-prod or staging and then doing your deployment productions, you've debugged, you've debugged your deployment processes on your way there, which is a very, very powerful way uh, to, uh, to, to, to run your software development lifecycle and really helps ensure that you don't have oopses by the time you go into production because you've, you know, you've, uh, uh, you've debugged the thing uh, along the way. So kind of going into uh, you know, a little bit of our example here. So uh, uh, context switching here into GitHub. Uh, so we've got our, uh, our GitHub uh, source repository here for our motorcycle storefront application. Um, and as you can see here, we've got our backend server, our front end server, Node.js, you know, all of all of those kinds of things. You know, this is a typical end tier uh, application. As we saw in the application model, we've we've modeled that uh, in in Flow as well. And really, what we want to do here is we, you know, we want to make a code change. You know, we want to change, you know, some green stuff to be red or some red stuff to be green. You know, very simple, you know, kind of change that we're making here, inserting some data. Uh, in, in, into the database here. And then, you know, we're going to commit this data uh, into, the, um, into the source code repository. Um, and this is where, you know, things get kind of interesting, right? Because this is really now where we're talking about how Jenkins and, and, electric, and, and uh, CloudBees flow uh, work together. So in this case, you know, Jenkins uh, gets, uh, gets a, a hook a call from GitHub uh, and does a, does a CI build, you know, runs, runs the build, does some unit tests. And then at the end of that, does a flow uh, trigger. So it triggers into flow uh, to kick off the release pipeline. So, you know, again, here an, an integration uh, between, uh, between the two products. That's actually existed for a long time. We obviously have lots of customers who use, uh, who use Jira uh, for, uh, or sorry, who use Jenkins uh, for, uh, for their CI. So we've, we've got a very tight, uh, you know, uh, uh, two-way integration between, uh, between Jenkins and, and flow. And now uh, Jenkins has done the CI, it has kicked off this release pipeline. So what we're looking at here now is the runtime incarnation of that release pipeline that we looked at earlier. And what we've seen in particular here, just a couple of things you know, I wanna point out is just, so we've ran through uh, all of the, uh, the pre-QA tasks. You know, we, we pulled JIRA tickets and this may be part of the, the audit reports that we're generating here. So we're pulling out the, the tickets that were part of the commits here. In this case, we're, we're not doing any Git checkouts here because Jenkins handled that for us, obviously. But maybe we're running some Sonar Cube stuff and maybe we, you know, we created a, uh, uh, we created a, uh, uh, a Docker container uh, to use to, uh, to deploy and, and manage our application here. So we'll run a twist lock uh, scan on that and maybe some other security tests. And then we transition into the, uh, into the QA phase. We deploy uh, to the QA environment, as, as, you, uh, as you remember a couple of slides ago, talking about how these stages can be associated with, with, uh, with environments. We run some functional tests on there and then maybe we update some JIRA tickets, right? Maybe we go back and say, all right, we, we, we pulled uh, all the issues that were part of this uh, part of this commit cycle, and now we're updating those issues, saying we ran all the functional tests and they were all tested. Again, this is all part of the you know the governance and, and auditability uh, requirements. And then we get to here, and you might notice that we're red here, and just talk a little bit about that because one of the things I want to mention is we're not always on the happy path, right? Not everything works all the time. You know, sometimes people trip over the network cables. Sometimes environments aren't set up properly. Sometimes environments are down. And, and one of the important things we have here, and I'll just kind of call, it, call this out and just talk about it a little bit is, you know, if you have a failure in a stage like this where, where something failed and you see there's a little one X here and, and it's a little bit of a subtle reminder that this was the first time through this stage. What I could do here is I can just rerun the stage. So let's say that we had a problem, right? We, maybe we ran, we, you know, we ran into a problem. We sent out a Slack notification saying, hey, we had a problem. Somebody goes and fix, fixes the issue and then comes back in and says rerun stage, right? So now we rerun the stage and, and you know, what we would see later on is this would then say 2X, meaning, hey, we ran the stage twice. And that's something that you wanna keep track of from a, from a kind of a key metrics perspective because that was rework, right? And, and, and really what we had to do was we had to run a stage twice because we had a problem. So you probably separately wanna have a little bit of a retrospective on that of what failed, why did it fail? 
you know, what can we do to make sure that doesn't happen in the future and so on. But the, the important part here being that, you know, you don't get kicked back to square one. It's not, you know, do not pass go, go directly to jail, do not collect $200. You fix the problem, you rerun the stage, you move on, just like you do in real life, just like you would if you weren't using this as, a, as an orchestration tool. So, and, and also from inside of this view, if you were interested in what all of these tasks were doing, because we're not just tracking this work, right? We're orchestrating this work. We're kicking off this work. We're doing this work. And you can drill down from here all the way down to the individual tasks that ran on individual machines, even look at the log files, you know, all of, all of, that, kind of, uh, all of that kind of output. But now as we get into the next stage here, so we re-ran the pre-prod stage, and if you notice, now it's green and it says 2x, meaning we ran it twice to, to get green. So that's good. But now we're, sti we're sitting here in, in, in the prod. And one of the things, and I'm just gonna jump back to the previous slide here, and, and as I talked about before, one of the things we do on the way out of the pre-prod stage is cre we create a ServiceNow ticket. And when we get to the prod stage, we're waiting here because we need that change request to be approved. And, and it's a manual uh, approval that we're waiting for, which is, you know, speak to the hand. Um, so we're sitting here kind of waiting for that. And if we go in and look uh, into, the, into the summary here, you'll see that we've actually, you know, we not only did we create the service now change request because we've, we've, you know, we've, we've got a, you know, bi-directional integration there, but we also just helpfully put the link in there for you so that if you are the right person to go in and approve this request. Now you could certainly just go straight into service now and do that if, if you live in the ITSM tools and, and, and never want to leave your ITSM tool, you can obviously do that. But if you're, if you're working uh, from the release pipeline here, you can click and go directly uh, into service now. And, and go into the ServiceNow ticket or whatever other ITIL or ITSM tools you're using. We, we integrate to others as well and do an approval. And then the bi-directional integration that we have between these tools, we'll be able to, to call back into flow and say, okay, thumbs up. We've gotten the manual approval for that and we can now go and proceed and go into production. So now you can see that we've, we've gone through uh, and, and done our deployment to production. Um, you know, using using the, the the deploy functionality, we probably ran you know some smoke tests for that. Now the deployment that we did here, I want to talk just a little bit about that. Now we there's a really rich set of deployment functionality in Flow, so you can just do straight up straight deployments. You know, just you know set up a, a bunch of WAR files, copy them out, restart you know WebLogic or JBoss or whatever it is that you're using or or IIS or or what have you. You know, literally hundreds of of integrations to, to those things. But you can also do very simple, but very sophisticated deployment methodologies. You can do blue-green, you can do canary deployments, you can do completely custom deployments if you want to do phased deployments. But here we're just doing a you know, simple deploy and then we're running some, uh, some smoke tests. And then if those pass, then we update the prod status and you know, notify people and, and those kinds of things. And then we've collected, after, after we go into prod, we then go collect all of the information that we might uh, need in order to do, you know, to generate audit reports and generate evidence for for uh, for all of the governance type activities uh, that that we need to do. So so just kind of summarizing here, we've seen kind of the entire commit to production lifecycle here with with deep and rich integrations with CI tools like Jenkins and ITSM tools uh, like ServiceNow, Slack integrations, Jira integrations, SonarCube, TwistLock, you know, tons of different integrations. Uh, to do this, to kind of make this the one place, the one pane of glass that you can manage uh, your, uh, your, your path to production, you know, sort of your, your commit uh, all the way through, uh, through production. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Sean. Well, thanks. That's really, really great um, overview, and I, I really appreciate it. It, it's, uh, it shows how much power we have uh, to deliver software safely and fast today. And, and, and Andres, I really appreciate how you showed you know, um, the entire orchestration from build test automation and Jenkins and triggering flow, how easily developers with, with a single you know, pull request uh, can, can create, you know, really kick off a very, uh, very complex and uh, however, uh, fairly well orchestrated pipeline of how to get that feature uh, into to production. So that, that, that was really great. And, and so, so I hope what folks walk away with as you see that is that there's there's a ton of things you can do today. But our intent with SDM, as we covered that earlier in the presentation, is to move both left and right and unify our suite into a single experience. 
so that uh, customers uh, have one place to go to be able to do CI, CD, ARO, analytics, inside, and can cover uh, more of the actual SLT, SLDC um, uh, you know, process itself left to right and get more teams, more individuals that are part of the natural process of building, delivering, supporting, marketing, selling software to, to, to your customers, that they're all part of the natural process of producing and bringing software to market. And when I think the organization is capable of doing that, that's truly when the DNA of the organizations will shift. That's truly when essentially uh, software development becomes a core part of your business process, the same way order to cash is a business process, same way candidate to productive employee is a business process. And that's the big opportunity that exists out there for organizations that are going through digital transformations to be able to do. And to, 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 to take that a little bit further, once you sort of go through and, and become really good at what Anders showed, which is what you can do today, and then next you adapt and become and think of this as a business process or a core part of your business and organization, that's when the data, the baseline of performance because starts get built and the signal system of record inside CloudBeast V3 gives you the opportunity to bring really, really advanced analytics across the entire chain to identify cluster behaviors where you might have challenges, where you have enough data connected in the system of record that allows you to start baselining how where issues occur that might impact your forecast of when your features will be delivered. This is where you can start dropping deadlines and instead intelligently forecast when and where uh, you will be delivering uh, software to market. And now the business really views and sees this as one intelligent contextual business process, much like many of the other processes within the organization. That's what's exciting to us which means that our future state, the things you can get started with today will be coming together in really, really, really conducive ways for our end customers, such that the seamlessness of this experience, whether you're an operations person, whether you're a developer, engineering management, PM, documentation, support, it doesn't really matter. You get a single sort of user experience towards all of this data that's coming through in the system of record. And all of these capabilities are being amplified by the brand new set of capabilities we're bringing into SDM through our product known as CloudBees V3. So in the future, state for us, very simple way for you to work with us and transact with us will be through our commercial offering CloudBees V3 and Jenkins X and Jenkins in the future. But this is, as you can see on the left side, a set of capabilities you can start with today. So that's sort of the journey we are on and why we're so excited, all of us, both on the electric cloud side and the cloud beast side to be joining forces because it's truly together, uh, we're able to do a lot more powerful things for our customers than individually. That's sort of the content presentation, but what do you do next? Where do we go from here? Uh, I think there's some great places for you to come and experience this technology, get your hands on it. Obviously, if this is something that you're interested in learning about now, uh, things like, um, you know, how is this procured? Is, does it run on, 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 on premise, which of course it does. And is there small team packages? Can I get started with that? Can I get, what is the price? All of those types of questions you can reach out to us via our website, or you can directly uh, email the info line for, for CloudBees. Uh, you'll be assigned uh, very quickly somebody to, to, to respond to you. So there's immediate actions you can take right away. But if you want to come and meet us in person, DevOps World, Jenkins World is a phenomenal um, uh, conference, yearly conference, where we co-host with the uh, CDF Foundation and Jenkins community, a, a, a large, large, several thousand people come and visit this conference where 
there's chock full of sessions, workshops, hands-on, demo booths, and there are, are a whole community of, of companies that are there that are focused on DevOps that will um, be on display. And there's a lot to learn. Networking opportunities are great. The first one's coming up in August in San Francisco, and we'll be running one in EMEA in December. Similarly to that, uh, Electric Cloud has been one of the founding members of the DevOps Enterprise Summit and been a member of that and, and had a largest presence there for multiple number of years. The DevOps Enterprise Sum Summit runs in, in June, just, uh, just ahead of the DevOps world in London, and then we'll come in October to Las Vegas. That's another place where you can come get hands-on and learn more about our products and talk to people who are experts within the field. But if you go to our website, You'll, under the event calendar, also found CloudBees Days. And we are these are one-day workshops that you can come to in sessions where you can learn about our solutions. And you can bring your own laptop, bring your team, and sit in and get hands-on with our technology as well. It's a great way of doing it. And we have quite a few of them coming up here um, internationally. Um, and, and we've just finished a series here in the in the U.S. and and uh, and so you may want to take a look at what's coming there, and maybe there's one close enough to your city you can attend. And then so of course Paris Jam area meetups for Jenkins is coming up as well. So a lot of different ways that you can get in touch with us and work with us and get to know. Another great place, just go to our website, request for information, get in talk, chat to an expert right there. There's multiple ways for you to get in touch with us. With that, um, I hope that we will find a path to go together. Anders and I are our resources you can tap on as well. We're available to chat with you. Um, and, and we hope we'll find and go on some journeys together like uh, thousands and thousands of customers that we've done with, done that with before. So with that, I'm gonna pass it back to the operator and, and, and I think we're gonna go a little bit to, to do a little Q&A. Yeah, we do have a couple minutes for questions, and we have gotten a ton of questions in so far. So um, we will get to as many as we can, but just uh, just so you guys know, if we don't get to your question during the question and answer period, uh, the folks at CloudBees will be getting a copy of all the questions, and I'm sure they'll be more than happy to follow up with you offline. But let's go ahead and dive right on in. The first one, um, I wanted to know how you are conducting, or sorry, collecting the audit reports, and also about the configuration edit history to find what, when, what went wrong when, and how those are collected as well. Uh, happy to talk about that. So. It, there's a lot of flexibility in terms of how audit reports are, are collected and, and generated. Um, you know, typically um, each organization is, you know, going to have a slightly different set of requirements for what they for what they uh, require. Um, but but almost always uh, that will include things like you know pulling information out of uh, issue tracking systems, um, for example, to see what functionality was included uh, in a in a particular you know release. You know whether this is a you know, I, I think Mark had asked a little bit earlier, I was watching the question, sort of isn't this kind of waterfall-y when I was showing the, the stages? And the answer is no, not, not at all. I mean, I think, um, just to side sidetrack for, for a little moment before I get back on the audit thing, it, it, you know, this release could be something that you do twice a day or 10 times a day, right? The, the, the real process here is if you're gonna do continuous delivery, you still need to build, test, qualify and release the software and deploy the software, right? And that's a process that you have to go through. Now, some software organizations may do that once a month, once a quarter, maybe even once a year still. And a lot of organizations are gonna do that multiple times a day. There's still a process that you need to go through. And, and one of the things too is, you know, I really focus kind of on one single release pipeline here. If, if you're working in a, in, a, in a more complex environment, one of the really powerful features around this is you may have multiple release pipelines that are going at the same time for various components that make up your applications. And, and so a lot of the power comes in around that. And so kind of back to the, 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 the question about auditing and, and, and governance and those kinds of things, it's really a question of what information you, know, you need in order to show your auditors um, you know, that you did what you document and and uh, and, and show you and, and kind of document what you do. A, a couple of thoughts on that. One one is simplifying greatly. Auditors basically want two things, right? They want you to document what you do, 
and they want you to prove that you did what you documented. I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying, but that, that is the essence of it. And, and, and something like a release pipeline in, uh, in uh, Electric Flow or in, in CloudBees Flow, and I, I didn't talk very much about this, but you can actually uh, define these things through code. So there's a domain specific language that you can use to define all of these things. So you literally have source code as documentation for how you do things. And then the runtime version of these things then are the proof that you did what you documented. And so if your auditors come back to you and say, hey, look, you know, we really want you to move that security scan earlier in the process. You know, we don't want you to even go into staging before you do that security scan. Then you know you 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 make that change, and then you can literally show the auditors either visually or or through code. Here's where we made the change uh, to run that security scan earlier in in the lifecycle. Uh, uh, that I think that's very important. And then in terms of change history and so on, that that's it, it's really functionality around you know something changed and it's not it was working yesterday and it's not working today. What changed? Who changed what? You know, so it's so it's really about you know uh, uh, more about sort of the team. You know, we, we're making some changes, we're evolving how we do these things and, and something broke, let's go figure out what changed so that we can, so that we can fix it. So that's more of a kind of a day-to-day -day, uh, day -day effort there. Excellent, okay, great. Um, let's see, I think we can get to one more. Uh, does electric cloud allow pipeline templates set up so teams can choose the appropriate template? Absolutely, and, and that's something I didn't cover uh, in the demo today, just out of uh, out of uh, concern for for time. But yeah, there, there there is a there's a lot of functionality in CloudBees Flow around um, templating and shared best practices. So you can have template pipelines, template applications. There's a whole uh, what we call service catalog uh, feature in 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 Flow, which out of the box gives you a set of um, uh, kind of jumping off points for creating CD pipelines. For creating uh, for creating integrations, you know all of those kinds of things, but that's fully customizable, so that you can give uh, your teams self-service access to do things like set up a CD release pipeline, uh, set up an environment, you know, tear down an environment, and and really what that does is, and, and self-service is really an important aspect of of how you get velocity on teams, because one one of the things we found over the years is, you know. Teams spend days, sometimes weeks, waiting for environments to be configured, simply because you have to go through the process, right? What's the, what does the security team say? What does the NetOps team say? All, all of those kinds of things. But it, when you can automate these things and provide best practices to the team and say, here's how this organization sets up an environment for doing X. Here's how we do an environment for Y. Here's how we do a CD pipeline for this kind of application. Here's how we do a CD pipeline for, for that kind of application. Then it's self-service. And then it's you know you 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 have the right permissions you go in and you click and and a couple of minutes later you have what you need as opposed to you know submitting a, a, a service now ticket waiting for the guy to get back to lunch and see the ticket and then you know two weeks later you have your environment which is you know typically the way the way things have worked so it's it's a it's a really powerful uh, functionality to allow you to 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 do self service with governance and again that's kind of our mantra you know speed with safety. All right. Great. We're about two minutes to the top of the hour, so unfortunately, I don't think we have any more time for questions. But unfortunately, but as I said before, that we, uh, the folks at CloudBees are getting a copy of all the questions, so I'm sure they'll be more than happy to follow up with you after today's event. Uh, I do want to remind the audience that today's event has been recorded, so if you want to listen to it again, or if you missed any or all of the event, uh, you will be able to access it on demand. We are going to be sending out a link in an email after today's event that will get you right to that webinar on demand. Uh, the webinar is also going to be living on the DevOps.com website, so you can always find it there. Just go to DevOps.com slash webinars and look in the on-demand section, and it should be right there waiting for you. Uh, Sean and Anders, thank you very much for walking us through your roadmap there and uh, giving us some great information. I'm sure it was most, most appreciated by the audience. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, Anders. And Thanks, thank Sean. you to... And thank you to the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon, and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody.